Hi, everybody, and welcome to the favorite Asian um, author book read. We're so glad you're joining us. Um, my name is Miley Martin. I work in student activities, and uh, we're just excited that uh, Asian American Month is this month of April and that you're joining us today. We're letting a lot of people to come into the room. Um, I am go I'm the host, one of the hosts, and my other host is Mai Yang. I'm going to introduce Mai right now. Go ahead, Mai. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mai Yang. I'm so glad to see you. I see everybody here. Mai, are you going to introduce your guest? Yes. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, you are here to hear some great stories this afternoon. So we have 10 uh, different uh, works from all genres for you this afternoon. So today's event concludes the celebration of Asian Pacific Islander Heritage Month. All right, so you guys are not here this afternoon to hear me uh, talk. So let's just go ahead and get started. So sit back, grab a snack and your favorite drink and get ready to listen to some awesome Asian work. So first in the spotlight is Pat Pondexter, who will read quotes from a philosopher and spiritual leader that will inspire us. Pat? Hello, I'm Pat Pondexter. I'm one of the adjunct librarians at uh, Fresno City College. And um, I've worked with Mai for quite a few years now, and I appreciate her for inviting me to be a part of this event. And, you know, I feel it's somewhat personal. I really owe my library career to an Asian librarian. She was the dean of, um, of our libraries at my undergraduate school when I was a student worker. And she encouraged me to pursue the career and she opened doors for me to get the funding necessary to complete my degree. So I'm, I'm very grateful for that. Um, I chose to read quotes from uh, Mahatma Gandhi and uh, Confucius as their teachings have in influenced and inspired me in my life experiences as well as in my education and career journey. Um, as many of you probably know, Gandhi was born in 1869. He was an Indian lawyer. He was a anti-colonial and political activist who employed nonviolent resistance to lead the successful campaign for India's independence from the British rule. Uh, he inspired many movements um, throughout the world, including the civil rights movement that was uh, led by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the anti-apartheid movement led by um, Nelson Mandela, uh, the uh, United Farm Workers Movement that was led by Cesar Chavez. And even if we look forward to 2021, 2020, 2021, the Black Lives Matters movement uh, has many influences uh, that are taken from Gandhi's uh, philosophy of nonviolent resistance to social change. Um, I was first introduced to his teachings as an undergraduate at the height of the civil rights movement. I mean, that was when I was in school. So. Um, and finally, President Trump's motorcade Hello. At a march last weekend, and Trump was seen giving a Hello. One thumb for every one he has left in office. Hello, are we still there? Woo! And that was my love. Pat, are we still there? Pat, I can hear you. Um, oh, okay. All right. There was somebody in the background and I wasn't sure. Yeah, I know. Uh, we're trying it's to see. No longer okay. And um, yeah. I want to go on here as best I can. Um, I have a few quotes uh, that speak to my beliefs that I would like to uh, quote from. I'm not going to like here. Well, the first quote, I, I object to violence <laughs> because it appears to do, because when okay. it appears to do good, the good is temporary. Oh. The evil, it does. Yeah, it Huey, Huey. Even if you are a minority of one, I, the truth is, you really, that's not you cannot change it. It is the truth. Um, anger and intolerance are the enemies of correct understanding. And we, you know, we're in a, a, a period in our history where that, that rings true. There is a higher court than courts of injustice and that is the court of conscience. It supersedes all other courts. 
a small body of determined spirits fired by an unquenchable thirst, an unquenchable faith in their mission can alter the course of history. And we've seen that throughout, throughout history and throughout our lives. No culture can live if it attempts to be exclusive. And that includes our culture. A no uttered from the deepest conviction is better than a yes, merely uttered to please or worse to avoid trouble. And you may recall a quote from the late John Lewis, civil rights icon and US representative from Georgia, get in good trouble. That's what he meant, get in good trouble for a just cause. Nonviolence is the greatest force at the disposal of mankind. It is mightier than the mightiest weapon of destruction devised by the ingenuity of man. And finally, I love this quote. It's, it's taken me you know, throughout, through, on journeys throughout my life be the change you wish to see in the world. Um, the next um, philosopher I'd like to uh, share is one that I was introduced to when I was an undergraduate student. I took philosophy class and um, his, his teachings and um, his philosophy on education and spirituality have uh, influenced me throughout my life. And that is Confucius who was born in 1551, and he's widely considered one of the most important and influential philosophers in the history of uh, humankind. Um, and he's known as one of the first teachers who wanted to make education universal. Uh, and his ancient philosophies remain influential today, not only in Asian cultures, but in cultures throughout the world. Um, and here are a few of the uh, quotes from Confucius that's that speak to my beliefs. You cannot open a book without learning something. And as a librarian, that rings so true. Mm -hmm. If I am walking with two other men, each of them will serve as my teacher. I will pick out the good points of the one and imitate them and the bad points of the other and correct them in myself. If you think in terms of a year, plant a seed. If in terms of 10 years, plant a tree. If in terms of 100 years, teach the people. When you know a thing, when you know a thing, to hold that you know it, and when you do not know a thing, to allow that you do not know it, that is knowledge. The will to win, the desire to succeed, the urge to reach your full potential, these are the keys that will unlock the door to personal excellence. I will not be concerned at other men's not knowing me. I will be concerned at my own want of ability. And finally, do not impose on others what you yourself do not desire. In other words, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Pat, for those inspiring words for us this afternoon. Um, next, we have Adriana Gonzalez, who is going to read a coming of age novel from a popular teen series that became a film. Adriana? Hi, I'm, um, this is To All the Boys I've Ever Loved by Jenny Han. It's kind of like a contemporary and they did um, make a Netflix um, little series about the book. Um, essentially, it's about a girl that she writes these love letters to um, her crushes or boys that she felt like going to age seven to in high school where she's a junior at the time of this book. And she just writes these love letters because she's overfilled with great emotions and um, she addresses them. And, but she doesn't ever send them out because it's a way of her trying to get over these boys. And essentially um, they mysteriously get sent to the receivers and her life just swindles into that. But um, it's a really good coming of age book. And I really enjoy like the representation because um, uh, <laughs> Laura Jean, the main character, she is half Korean and half Caucasian. And um, her father is single because her mom died. And in the novel, it says something about um, her mother dying from like hitting her head. So kind of like a weird, quirky way to 
to die. But um, and then her main love interest is also a um, his parents are a divorced couple living with um, two single uh, parents. So it's really good representation of what it's like having single parents and what it's like being a minority. So um, I have a little quote and it says, which I feel like best describes the whole book and um, kind of a way to just like um, understand Laura Jean's point of view. It says, you'd rather make up a fantasy version of somebody in your head than be a real person. And that's essentially what um, it was like creating these fantasies in her head the entire time and writing these um, love letters that she was imagining different, um, like running through flowers, um, going on picnic dates and all types of other fantasies that she wanted to live out with these boys. And that's essentially what the book is about. It's a really great read. It's super easy. I finished it within a day and there's like three other parts and um, they also made movies about it, which is kind of accurate, but it's better to read the book first. That sounds good, Adriana. Thank you for sharing with us. Next, we have Diane, Diana, Diane Zhang, who will thrill you with some poetry from a Vietnamese American poet. Diane? Hi, guys. My name is Diane. Um, I will be reading The Night Sky with Exit Wound by Ocean Wong. Um, I am a really big poetry reader, but I've never read anything like this. And so this is a Vietnamese author who writes about um, his life um, back in Vietnam. Um, I find it really interesting. So I do have a few pages here that I will read. Um, okay, so threshold. In the body where everything has a price, I was a beggar. On my knees, I watched through the keyhole, not the man showing, but the rain falling through him. Guitar strings snapping over his gobbled shoulders. He was singing, which is why I remember it. His voice, it filled me to the core like a skeleton. Even my name knelt down inside me, asking to be spared. He was singing, it is all I remember. For in the body, where everything has a price, I was alive. I didn't know there was a better reason. That one morning, my father would stop. A dark cloud paused in downpour and listened for my clutched breath behind the door. I didn't know the cost of entering a song was to lose your way back. So I entered, so I lost. I lost it all with my eyes wide open. And then the other, the next one that I have here, it's pretty interesting to me. Sorry, it's like I marked everything here. Okay, so this is the other one that spoke out to me, um, Telemachus. Um, like any good son, I pulled my father out of the water, dragged him by his hair through white sand, his knuckles carving a trail the waves rush in to erase. Because the city beyond the shore is no longer where we left it, because the bombed uh, cathedral is now a cathedral of trees, I kneel beside him to see how far I might sink. Do you know who I am, Ba? But the answer never comes. The answer is the bullet hole in his back, briming with seawater. Um, he is still, I he is so still, I think I he could be anyone's father. Found the way in a green bottle might appear. At a boy's feet containing a year he has never touched, I touch his ears, no use. I turn him over to face it, the cathedral in, the, in his sea black eyes. The face not mine, but one I will wear to kiss all my loves, all my lovers good night. Um, the way I seal my father's lips with my own and begin the faithful work of drowning. Um, so basically this poetry has a lot of like history um, in regards to like his past. And so these are just some of the important um, uh, pages that spoke out to me. Great, thank you for sharing, Diane. Next, uh, we have uh, Jenny. There are some great novels that are exclusively online um, as well. Do you guys don't believe me? Let's listen to Jenny. All right, so um, I the book I chose, um, <clears throat> it's, um, it's called Trial, Marriage, Husband, Need to Work Hard. I know that, I guess within translation and everything else, um, it doesn't 
go very as smoothly. Um, but I do love like Korean dramas and Chinese dramas, and I do like web novels. So that's why I chose um, chose this particular one. It is um, almost two thousand chapters long, um, but um, a little bit of it is uh, repetitive in. Um, in the sense that, you know, she goes through a hard time and then she comes out of it and she's successful every single time, right? Um, but I like those, um, you know, warm, fuzzy feelings that that you get from um, those kind of dramas. And so, let me see here. This one, um, there's something really about a heroine that transfers uh, or transitions from like a meek, kind, uh, generous person to a formidable opponent. She's in the um, uh, she's in the industry, the um, where she's a model and an actress and everything else, um, and she really just. Um, she has her secret maneuvers that she's able to um, to overcome all of her opponents. Um, she doesn't initiate anything negative herself, um, but she does um, she does overcome all of um, all of the attempts that that come her way that people put to try and sabotage her. So I'm going to read you a little um, portion of it's the second chapter. Um, and I'm gonna just read a bit of that one. Hopefully I can stay within my five minutes. So it says, in all honesty, Tanning had uh, Tang, Tang Ning had never realized she was so brave. She had actually married a stranger, but what was done was done. She would never regret her decision. Tang Ning returned to her car just as she was about to start the engine and head home. She received a phone call from Han Yufan. Tang Ning, where are you right now? In front of si civil affairs office about to go home, Tang Ning replied casually, hiding her emotions. Euro has a very important show. I need you to substitute her immediately. I'll tell the makeup artist to provide you with the mask. No one will be able to tell it's you. Han Yufan ordered with a tone of superior, with the tone of a superior. Since Euro is injured, you'll have to suffer a little. Didn't you say Miss Mo got hurt on stage? In that case, the media should already know she is at the hospital. But I've already asked someone to let it slip that she will still be attending even with her injuries. I told you to go, so go. He was so shameless. In the past, Tang Ning had already done stupid things like this for Mo Euro. As it seems, she was being used. However, she wasn't going to continue this way. Tang Ning stayed calm and nodded. Okay, let me know the time and address. I'll head over there now. Tang Ning, we're about to get married. Help give Euro a bit of a boost. Her career is currently on the rise. I'll give her a boost for sure, Tang Ning responded with a hidden meaning. I'll hang up then. Let's have dinner later. Han Yu Fan had no idea the tables had turned. Presumably now, he would be sitting by Mo Euro's bedside, watching over his lover tenderly. Tang Ning hung up the phone before giving her manager a call. Her manager immediately responded in anger. President Han wants you to step in for that B-grade model. Is he joking? If you didn't decide to retreat from the spotlight, she would never even survive in the industry. Long Ji, I've already agreed, Tang Ning replied calmly. Do you really have to go? Her manager was about to spew blood in disbelief. Tang Ning and Mo Yuro were both models signed under Tiani Entertainment. But because of Tang Ning's decision to retreat, her manager was dragged down with her and ridiculed. Tang Ning knew her manager wanted to stick up for her injustice. Reassuring, reassuringly, she responded, I won't be that stupid anymore. I will not let them use me. After hearing those words from Tang Ning, her manager's face lit up. So are you saying you have a plan? Long Ji, from now on, I can only trust in you. Can you help me do something? Speak, her manager was loyal to her. After all, they shared the same objective. Mo Euro is so desperate to convince the media that she is attending the show, even with her injuries, because she doesn't want it to impact her eligibility for the top 10 model awards. Help me pay a visit to Tian He Hospital. I see you're getting, I see what you're getting at. Obtain evidence that she is still at the hospital during the show and reveal it to the public. The manager smiled excitedly. No, I have bigger news. She's pregnant and the child is Han, um, Han Fuan. Also help me prepare the statement stating that Han Yufan 
has used me multiple times to substitute Mo Euro during her shows. As for which shows, I will need you to help me find evidence for that. The manager was surprised at first, but quickly understood why Tang Ning's attitude had changed. Such a shameless cheating couple. Not only did they cheat, but they also used Tang Ning, ordering her around like a puppet. Don't worry, Tang Ning, I will help you do all these things. Tang Ning did not respond. She felt usually calm, unusually calm. She was going to treat them like they treated her. And then I'll just stop there because I know I'm running short on time. But um, it's really an interesting story. And I wish I could have read it to the end of the section. But it turns out that she married um, the guy that she had marrying, the stranger she ended up marrying, um, was the president of another big uh, media company. And then it just kind of the story goes along with um, her rise back to um, stardom. So it's kind of it's a fun one. Thank you for sharing, Jenny. That does sound like an interesting novel. I can't wait to read that one. Thanks. Okay, um, so it's my turn again. Hello, everybody. My name is Mai Yang. The story that I'm going to choose to read today is called um, Dear, Dear Story Cloud by Jia Cha. And I chose this book for a special reason. So we have a lot of students with, the, with us this afternoon. Students from all levels of education, from the elementary school level to college, can now see that there are many Southeast Asian professionals um, at, in colleges and schools and uh, in different types of roles, um, from office staff to teaching to counseling. So this was not the case when I attended college at Fresno State. In my days, there were zero Southeast Asians working on campus in any kind of job. We know how difficult the life of a student can be. We want to look up to others who like us, um, want to, uh, to, we look up to others who are like us to keep us going, to help us to succeed. None of the uh, ones at Fresno State that I saw could help me uh, with that in that role since there were no Southeast Asian uh, employees uh, on campus. So I looked to books uh, written by someone of Southeast Asian descent to inspire me on my hardest days. So then I came across Dia Story uh, Cloth by Dia Cha at the Madden Library at Fresno State. I can relate to the book on many levels. Dia is a Hmong female writer. There were no Hmong writers I came across, let alone a woman. I was so excited when I saw the book. The story class that Dia used in the story was created by her aunt and uncle while they were in a refugee camp. In the middle of the book, she shows the entire story cloth. So what she did was she took each piece of the story cloth to tell her stories. So this is what her um, entire story cloth looks like. And a story cloth can be as small as uh, 12 by 12 inch or as big as five feet by 10 feet. So they're uh, varying in sizes. I think Dia's story of her family escape from the communist soldier and resettlement in America touched me because it could have been my own stories. And I think many other moms who came to the US as a, when they were really young can relate to the book as well. Her book inspired me to keep going, even though some days and some semesters were really tough and I felt like giving up. The story always reminded me of the sacrifice my parents made to get us to America. I never let one day go by um, without being thankful that it's because of my parents' courage and it's their courage that is the backbone of my success today. So I am pleased to read to you some of Dia's words from her book. But as I was growing up, the peaceful life of my village was disappearing. Laos was caught up in warfare. My country was divided into two. On one side, many Hmong men joined the Loyalist Army, which was supported by the American government. On the other side was the communist regime, which also recruited many Hmong men. My father left to fight with the Loyalist troops. My family began to move from village to village to escape the communist soldiers. Communist soldiers came to the Hmong villages and captured the men. They tied the Hmong's hands behind their backs and took them away. The Hmong men kneeled down, begged for their lives. 
but the soldiers didn't listen. The Hmong women couldn't do anything to help. They cried and cried because they knew they might never see their husbands and son again. My father was sent to fight in Zhangquan province. He never came back. We don't know whether he was killed or captured. In 1975, the Americans pulled out of Laos and the communist regime took over. My mother was determined to get us out of Laos. I was 10 years old when we fled. Escaping meant we had to cross the Mekong River, but the river was dangerous. People who didn't have boats had to cross by swimming or using inner tubes and bamboo poles to stay afloat. Many people died trying to cross the river. This story cloth reminds me of the history of my family and of my people. Some of the memories it brings are good and some are bad, but it is important for me to remember everything the Hmong have been through. Hmong women in America continue to stitch new story cloth. We all have vivid memories of our lives and, cap and culture and history. The story cloth is a bridge to all the generations before us. When I show the story cloth to my niece and nephew who were both born here in the United States, I point to different pictures and tell them that this is what it was like. So again, this is Dia Cha's story cloth and we do have a copy in the Fresno City College Library. So I highly recommend this book for you guys to read. Thank you so much for listening. My, that was awesome. You know, the history of the Hmong people is so fascinating to me personally. And um, I know that they carried their history. They didn't have a written history or books. And so the story cloth connected their history to current day. And, um, you know, the Hmong history is so vivid and beautiful, but so filled with um, tragedy and challenge and, um, that was a great choice. Yeah. Thank you so much. You, well, everybody, how are you doing? We are here enjoying our favorite Asian author book read with all of yeah. our, our readers and our participants. We have we do have a lot of time, so we are going to move forward. And I have a group of readers that are going to share their passion and their books and their reasons for why they've chosen them. I will also participate, but I'm first going to uh, our, my first reader is uh, a young man who is passionate about writing, poetry, and he's FCC alumni. He also happens to be my son. Please welcome Harrison Lutz. So Harrison, take uh, it away. Hello, everyone. Uh, like Miley said, my name is Harrison. And I chose for my book, uh, I chose Haruki Murakami's What I Talk About When I Talk About Writing. Um, so for, for some people that are familiar with the name or maybe the students that have seen his name attached to books on reading lists to look into it, you're probably wondering why I chose this and not like the Wind of Bird Chronicles, which I also own, uh, highly recommend it, it's very good, and Kafka on the Shore is also very good, uh, but this one was kind of prescient for where I feel like I'm at in my life, so I'll tell you why uh, in a second why I picked it. Um, but Murakami is a really interesting uh, modern Japanese author. He does this great job of blending kind of these surrealistic, dreamy things with uh, in his stories. And they usually follow kind of like um, a young Japanese boy. And then the, the setting is usually the backdrop is Japan at some at very points of time. Um, but yeah, I chose, so I'm going to read two passages from this book. It's more this, so he mostly writes fiction. This book particularly is kind of more like partial memoir on and reflections on writing and running. So um, this first passage is really short and it says, at any rate, that's how I started running. 33, that's how old I was then. Still young enough, though no longer a young man, that age the age that Jesus Christ died, the age that Scott Fitzgerald started to go downhill, that age may be a kind of crossroads in life. That was the age when I began my life as a runner, and it was my 
belated but real starting point as a novelist. So the reason I picked this book and really um, resonated with me is I feel like I'm kind of at that crossroads that he's referencing. Um, Murakami, which I found out through this book, has a really interesting story. So he was running like this little jazz club in Japan with his wife. <clears throat> and one day he was sitting out watching a baseball game and he had this revelation like, oh, I have this idea for a story. And so when you run and own and operate a jazz club, as you can imagine, you're working all the time, long nights. So he'd come home at like three in the morning and say, I'm just going to write until I basically fall asleep. And he submitted this little uh, short story that he had written. He won a, a, a young or a new novelist prize. And he decided like, I might wanted to try to go down this road. So he told his wife, I'm just going to sell the jazz bar and give myself two years to try and write. And everyone told him, you shouldn't do it. You're not going to make as much money as you are running this jazz bar. And he became Haruki Murakami, which I think at least some of you know who he is just upon me saying his name. So, and like Miley said, I'm kind of, I'm 20, going to be 28 next month. And I've been thinking a lot about writing and wanting to take some time to write. So this was kind of a fun little like push to maybe you should just take that uh, time and just go for it. Um, and so I want to close with this a uh, little bit longer passage, but it kind of culminates everything that was about the book and why I really enjoyed it. Um, so he talks about running and how it helped him write because you really have to just get up every day and say, I'm going to run. Like he runs uh, at least a few miles every day. He's participated in a marathon every year. He's pushing 50 something now, I believe, and he's done it every year since 33. And he even started, uh, this book was published in 2007, but starts chronicling him preparing for marathon or uh, triathlons as well. So he really kept uh, kicking up the notch. Um, so this is the other passage. Um, in any event, I'm happy I haven't stopped running all these years. The reason is I like the novels I've written, and I'm really looking forward to seeing what kind of novel I'll produce next. Since I'm a writer with limits, an imperfect person living an imperfect, limited life, the fact that I can still feel this way is a real accomplishment. Calling it a miracle might be an exaggeration, but I really do feel this way. And if running every day helps me accomplish this, then I'm very grateful to running. People sometimes sneer at those who run every day, claiming they'll go to any length to live longer. But I don't think that's the reason most people run. Most runners run not because they want to live longer, but because they want to live life to the fullest. If you're going to while away the years, it's far better to live them with clear goals and fully alive than in a fog. And I believe running helps you do that. Um, and yeah, so that really just spoke to me to focus on clearly what you want in life and go after those goals and keep pushing. And um, the reason he said he, he sold the bar was because he said, I'm a person that has to commit to something fully. I can't, I'm not savvy enough to run a nightclub and write a book. If I'm going to be a writer and write a book, I'm going to do just that. So um, that inspired me. And I hope it inspired you guys too, to just find it is, find what it is through the fog and uh, go for it. Thanks. Harrison, can you show the book? Somebody asked to see the book. Could you hold it up? Oh, right yeah, I have this background. It's kind of cutting out. But hold it it's... up right in front of your face, usually. Well, OK, that's good. Yeah. So yeah, it's, I'll put it in the chat, too. The title's kind of kind of weird, but he said it's um, it's a, it's a play on words from a novel that he likes. It's called when I what I talk about when I'm talking about something. I forget what the last part is. And he asked the the novelist who wrote that is is dead now, but he asked his wife if he could kind of use that phrasing for his book, and she gave his she gave his approval for it. Okay, so there was a question if all of the books are going to be highlighted in this. Um, maybe Mike could work on that, or we can. We we have it in the program, Miley, the list okay. of the authors and the books uh, for all the readers today. Okay, um, we we'll try and share the program. Maybe you can do that, Mike. Okay. While I'm doing this. Okay. Yes. No so thank you, Harrison. That was great. I know uh, you're a very passionate reader and you've got a lot of books. So I appreciate that. I am going to go on to our next reader. 
Um, so next sharing with us is Karen Crockett, who is our English instructor, a longtime English instructor at Fresno City College. And she also participates with the UCL program. I also interviewed um, Karen for the Asian American Month, our FCC Spotlight. And um, I'm just so glad, Karen, that you're joining us. I am looking for you right now so I can spotlight you. Um, oh, there you are, okay. So Karen, go ahead, I'm gonna pin you. There you go. Okay, hello everyone. I'm going to be reading from Tess Teresa Holt's uh, book, When the Elephants Dance. And um, I have used this book for quite a few years in my UCI class. And every time I, I say I'm gonna use a different book, I ask the students what they think and they say, no, you should continue using this book. So, and one of my students, Peter, who's here today, I believe, um, suggested this story. It's called The Twilight People. Oh, and by the way, this woman uh, wrote this book when she was, I believe, 31 years old. Um, and she's an amazing storyteller. When I was a young man, our family was not considered the lowest rung on the ladder. We were the dirt below the lowest rung. But within our village, my family was well respected because of my special gifts. I was born under a red harvest moon with the birthing sack still covering me. If the sack is buried immediately under a chosen place, revealed to the mother in her dreams, the infant will inherit certain gifts. I had the gift of sight, of seeing those beings that others cannot. I could see the twilight people. We lived in the Visayans in a village in Northwest Samar. The houses were all the same, made of palm leaves and bamboo, all were raised on six foot stilts to allow the ocean to rush under without washing away the houses. They were known as Baha'i Kubos, straw houses. I called them feather houses because they were so fragile that they threatened constantly to blow away with the wind. In between each dwelling, coconut trees sprouted, inhabited by lime green parrots, chattering mina birds, and the red hornbilled bee eaters. The large branches cast shadows on my face at noon. Our farthest neighbors were a few feet away, the nearest ones in arm's length. The houses were so flimsy that during the tempestuous monsoons, our father ran away, ran around with palm leaves, patching the holes carved by the strong gales. The winds were so forceful that the purple salamanders um, crawling upside down on the ceiling, lost their footing and fell kamikaze onto our beds at night. Every evening during high tide, the water through, uh, came through our floorboards and floated our slippers away. I woke shivering and barefoot in the morning, searching for my thong chinelas. I found them at the end of our short hallway, holding congregation with other slippers. My life, was seeking every conceivable type of employment. The most perilous was collecting bird's eggs in limestone caves where Salanga, uh, Salangana bird's nests were perched 60 feet high above crystal clear water and coral reefs with nothing but crevices to, to cling to. The eggs were a delicacy and the saliva from the young were considered a cure for certain diseases. Salanganas are the chief ingredients in bird's nest soup and were considered an aphrodisiac by our Chinese residents. The work paid handsomely. My father and I were very talented at finding such caves, but I tried my best to keep him from this. He was growing too old for such climbing. I worked at as many jobs as I could to help my parents put rice on the table for my sister Addie and me. I'm gonna skip a section, um, but let me tell you about my visions. I could see the spirits and other beings, just as I can see you here before me. I could see the old man who used to live across the street from me. He had been dead for weeks, but I saw him follow the same ritual every morning as if he was still alive. He opened his door, walked to the end of the path, looked out into the gray ocean with its fishing spear over his shoulder. 
He still did this after his death, but I was the only one who could see him. I could walk into a house and see the anger that hovered in the air from a fight in the form of a sneering woman with a pale face. I was gifted, the old people said, but I thought otherwise. I did not want to see these things. It was troublesome to sit in a room full of people and not shout when a spirit came to stand in front of me or ran its fingers through my hair. A neighbor once took me to a gambling establishment in hopes that my talent extended to reading cards, but it did not. Um, anyway, that's a wonderful story about um, a young man who can see um, people who have passed away. And uh, I can't believe this woman wrote this when she was 31 years old. Um, she, had, she weaves kind of history. Um, she's Filipino. She weaves history in with her stories and some of it's brutal because it was during um, uh, when the Japanese soldiers were in the Philippines. So it's kind of brutal sometimes and it's kind of hard for me to read, but um, her storytelling is amazing. So thank you for letting me share. Karen, that was beautiful. I don't know if it's it's the way she describes everything. It's like, I can see it. it she, there's a certain, or it's the way you're reading. It's just so gentle. And it, I just, it makes me want to read the, that book. It's just the way she described it from the beginning. I really like that. And the way you read the passage just was so soothing. Maybe it's the cherry blossoms in the background. I don't know. Oh. Very, very soothing. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing with us. I really like that. That's a great author. Wow. So everybody, our next reader uh, needs not really, doesn't need a huge introduction, but we all know John Cho as the creator of Asian American Day Week Month at Fresno City College. He is also a writer. He's got a book of poetry. He is the legacy maker at Fresno City College and our good friend. John Cho, I know you're going to be reading from your book. And if you, you know, we've got some time, you could actually read two poems if you'd like. But go ahead, John, you've got the floor. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, thank you, Miley. Uh, Karen, uh, very nice read. So uh, <laughs> I don't know if you can see this, probably not, but it's okay. Uh, I, wrote, I wrote this poem, this book called 88 Poems by Cho. Uh, before you start to think, boy, this guy is really egotistical. Why does he need to put his name in the title? Well, to answer that is uh, I Googled 88 poems and somebody else had used that title. Uh, it was 88 poems by Ernest Hemingway. So I, I didn't want to compete with Mr. Hemingway. So I titled it 88 poems by Cho. Uh, the reason for the 88 poems is uh, Chinese like the number eight because it sounds like fa or fat, you know? So anyway, but uh, Actually, I did a, a event last week, a Zoom session last week, where I read some of the poems. And then Miley asked me last week if I wanted to read a poem for today. And so she said, uh, read something that people can relate to. Okay. So I decided to pick a poem uh, titled Awakening Hero. And the reason it's called Awakening Hero is kind of like an ode or a poem dedicated to my father who had passed away more than 10 years ago, okay? So why is that relatable? I think for most of the people here today, uh, your father is still living. So what I mean by still living is, now's the time to cherish uh, your father, uh, your interactions with your father and stories. So let me go ahead and, and read the poem. Okay. Uh, Awakening Hero, an ode to my father, Cho Jin Hong. An apt description, a quiet man with the strength to endure. He never complained, nor would he sue anybody, the tram driver or the dog owners. Unlike his children, we gripe, vent, and bitch. Restaurant work, arriving in America as a teenager, he washed dishes, proud that he was promoted to a cook in two years. At Imperial Dynasty, worked alongside a married Japanese couple for the Wing family, whose son married Miss Hong Kong. They were chefs in French cuisine, I think. 
found a wallet. He never told me this. It was mother's story. He mailed it back to the address. Mother thought that was stupid. We're poor. We could use the money. Lesson on morality? Cho's Kitchen in Selma. There were two versions. The rented one, which was torn down to build a car wash. The permanent one, which was an empty building. They bought it. So no more being told to vacate. Part so in life. The crazy man, an escaped inmate of an insane asylum in Visaya. He hitched a ride on the old 99. Driver deposited him. After closing, little brother said, daddy's fighting. Mother fainted. Sister called the cops. I watched. Father fight a much bigger man. Cat Chow Main, Fulton Mall tram. Heard him for over a week. Could not stand. Closed by the health department for using cat meat. Totally false, but the rumor spread. Business dived. People believe what they want, no matter how long they know you. Cancer, discovered in ER for something completely different. Received chemo and radiation for cancer of the throat. Oncologist with the trophy picture wife claimed, his cancer is cured. He must have died of something else. No autopsy, please. The end. Before passing, I inquired how he wanted to end. Cremation and spread ashes in the mountains. Not for a love of the great outdoors. No need for the heirs to buy sin. Who would know? Obligation free. Lessons never spoken. Do the right thing, whatever that is. What I have, memories like everybody else and a $20 train set from Sears Roebuck for Christmas. The thought is always greater than the object. I am my father's son. That's my poem. <laughs> John, that's great. And it's very relatable. And I think how you shared it, it's awesome. 80, so you wrote 88 poems. Yes. How, how did you pick that number because of the auspicious number? Uh, well, what happened was the first poem I wrote, I, I dedicated it to my mom. Okay. And then, so I started writing more poems. And then after a while, gosh, if I wrote one to my mom, I need to write one to my dad. So I wrote one to my dad. And so I started writing more poems. And because I don't think I'm like a, a poet poet, I, I really feel more like a, a storyteller. So this is, I'm, I'm putting my thoughts into words type, type of thing. And so the idea is like, when I started hitting like 30, 40 poems, it says, hey, I'm, I'm gonna shoot for the 88. And so what I decided to do was, I'm gonna cover every letter in the alphabet from A to Z. And that's what I did. <laughs> so, yeah. so that's my accomplishment. I, I put it in self-published um, 2018. Thank you, John. Thank you so much for sharing. That You're was very awesome. Welcome. Okay, moving right along. I am going to be pinning our uh, Dean of um, Educational Services and Pathway Effectiveness for the Career and Technology Center, Gurminder Sangha. Gurminder, thank you for joining us. And um, everyone, you should know it is Asian American Month, but it's also Sikhism, Sikh Heritage Month as well. So welcome. Please share a little bit about yourself and what you're going to be reading. Thank you, Molly. Thank you, Mai. And uh, uh, Professor Cho and Dr. Cho, your, your, your poem was very relatable and very touching. And then my father is still alive. And uh, I wish I could spend more time with him, but I will definitely take your advice and spend some time with him. So there's no doubt. So uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Molly, for having me. Um, and today I will be, and I will introduce myself. So today I will be reading uh, a poem from a book of, uh, of Shiv Kumar Batalavi. And uh, he was, uh, he was born in, in 1936 um, in Punjab, state of Punjab, which was then in Pakistan, which is now in Pakistan because 1947, 
you know, Punjab was a bigger state and then it was divided and then, but he was born in the uh, Punjab region, which is now is called, you know, West Punjab, so or East Punjab in this case. And then he passed away in 1973. And only thing relatable to me is that he passed away the day I was born. Um, so that's the, that's the only thing I can say. Uh, and the reason I chose uh, to read his poem, because I have always been away from the state of Punjab where my parents were born. So I did not get a chance to learn the Punjabi language. Um, so I, I was, you know, I, 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 I learned um, Hindi and Sanskrit, but I never really learned my mother tongue until I was 13 or 14 years old. And then I start learning uh, my own language or Punjabi by watching TV. Um, and then I slowly, slowly start reading, uh, learn how to read. And um, so that's how I kind of self-taught myself how to read and write uh, Punjabi language myself. And uh, I heard him when I was a very young, I heard him on one of the radio stations, you know, um, uh, or his recording, one of his recordings on one of the radio stations, and it was very touching. I was a young boy, and uh, he uh, became one of the youngest recipient. When I say he, Shiv Kumar became the youngest recipient of the um, Sahitya Academy Award, which is equivalent to a National Academy of Letters, like very big, prestigious award. He was the youngest, and he got that in when he was 29 years of age. Um, so I will be kind of reading a poem from his book and he's kind of wrote a lot of plays. Uh, one of his plays is now become a masterpiece in the modern Punjabi literature. Um, so if you ever talking to a, a mid, you know, mid forties or mid 50 person from Punjab, if you talk to him about if you have heard a poem or poet named uh, Shiv Kumar, most likely they will say yes and they will enjoy his poems. And uh, many songs have been sung by many great uh, singers uh, in his poem. So that's the poem I will be reading. Um, so again, a little bit about myself. My name is Kriminder Sangha uh, and I'm from, uh, migrated from India in 1996. Um, and here I am and I will try to read the poem which is going to be very hard for me to translate in, in English because context is very important. And then uh, I am also, every time I read a poem, it gives me a deeper understanding and meaning and what is author really trying to convey, how he is trying to put words uh, that carry a deeper meaning. Um, and then only he can explain the agony and pain or suffering or love so he's a romantic poet. So, um, so I'll kind of uh, try to read uh, a poem for you. So, so his the poem is uh, it's, it's a song, but it's a it's called Ki Pochdeo Hal Fakiranga. So, for example, Miley will ask me, Griminder, how are you doing? So he's going to give answer to how are you? So he's going to say, so let me read it one. I will read two stanzas. I'll read first stanza that I'll try to explain the meaning Then I'll read the second stanza then I'll try to uh, translate that in English. So here we go. Ki puch deo hal fakiranda Ki puch deo hal fakiranda Sada nadiyon vichde niranda Sada hanj di june ayanda Sada hanj di june ayanda Sada dil jaliyan dil giranda Sada dil jaliyan dil giranda Ki puch de o hal fakiranda so that's what he's saying. So Miley asked me, how are you? So he's gonna say, why do you ask? Why are you asking this mendicant wanderer? I'm a person who has nothing. I'm a person who is begging and I'm singing. So it's gonna mendicant wanderer. So he's just going out and singing song. He, and I am, uh, uh, I am a water separated from a river. 
However, I have come to this life in a life of a tear. So he's talking about, I have come to this life as a life of a tear. However, I have departed from the river, right? So I'm a water, but depart from, but came to this life as a tear. However, I am a heartbroken. This question, but thank you for asking me that question, but I'm going to tell you that the life I am in is of a tear. Um, I don't want to say heartburn or heartbroken lover. So that's kind of the meaning of the first uh, first paragraph or stanza. The next one. Eh jaan deyaan kush shokh jahe Rangaan da hi naan tasveeraan hai Jad hat gaye asi ishke di Mul kar baithe tasveeraan da so in this he's saying is that knowing well that um, that life or the people or names, they are pictures. They are made up of different colors. Um, however, I fell in love them so dearly that, that I, I kind of, so I bought those pictures which are made up of those uh, those the, those those beautiful colors but they're emotionless like even though they are emotions i have deeper feeling from them but they are just pictures right so um it's hard to explain like how like i can feel at a very big, deepest level that he is trying to share his his grief or story and heartbroken and sadness uh, um, uh, and there is, uh, this poem is a very long poem that he tells the whole story about why does he feel the way he feels. Uh, then he goes to a different deeper manner. So many analogies he used, uh, which like I have to create that, that environment or context for people to understand. So it is very difficult, but that is one of the poems, um, uh, one of my favorite poems of, of, of him. And every time I read, uh, it just brings tears to my my eyes is that how he's able to express his feelings for his love and how he chooses the words which has a deeper meaning for us to relate to. For example, I'm a water, but I have come to this life as a life of a tear, right? So that's kind of the conclusion of my, my poem, so. Very powerful, a Punjabi metaphor for life in so many ways. Yes, 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 yes. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Wow. I like that. The tear you come from the, the river as a tear. That I'm gonna, I'm gonna just think about that for a while. So everyone, we are coming up on getting close to the end. And so I'm going to be the final presenter. So for many of you probably don't know this, but I've been at Fresno City College for 15 years. And when I first started, I read in the Rampage about uh, Lee Herrick, who is a Korean adoptee. Well, I'm also a Korean adoptee, and so I connected with Lee way back then, and um, I just thought that was so cool. I don't meet a lot of Korean adoptees, and to meet someone at Fresno City College was very awesome. So when Lee Herrick came out with his book, um, uh, This Many Miles from Desire, um, I guess I have to, I guess I've got to pin myself, I guess. Uh, this Many Miles from Desire. This is his first book of poetry, I guess, okay. Um, the first poem is called Three Dreams of Korea, Notes on Adoption. So I'm just gonna read the first one. So uh, this spoke to me because I, I was left supposedly in a basket on the courtroom steps of Seoul and adopted when I was about, I don't know, three months old. So my American father flew all the way to Korea to get me. And um, so this was special when I read this poem. So I'll read it very quickly. This one happens in the morning as a nearby crow wakes me calling, God, God, look at this. I am on the steps of a church wrapped in Monday's Korea times telling of the drought in Pusan. You can live by the water and still die of thirst. And I there on the cold brick steps am dying 
but dying means the presence of breath. This one happens on Hangul Day, Independence Day in Seoul, where girls in purple satin hanboks parade through downtown streets. In this dream, I make eye contact with every single one of them. Another boy, a few years older than I, rides a tricycle in the parade, trailing the girls. He sees me, he winks, as if he knows how everything will end. So for me, that was very powerful because, you know, the story, I mean, all the babies in Korea at that time, either you ended up in the dump, or if you're lucky, you were in an orphanage. Um, and being a female, you know, it, so I feel very humbled and blessed that I got adopted. And this, this poem just, there's so many ways it could have gone, you know? So it spoke to me and uh, Lee has written many, I think he's on his third book of poetry, I could be wrong, but um, the first poem right out the gate, it was like, gosh, that's me. And he has three more, but we are past our time. Um, so this spoke to me. I know there's quite a few things in the chat. I want to thank all of our presenters, all of um, all of you that shared. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to have uh, my say a few words too. But for my group, thank you so much for your passion, your insight, um, John, for writing the poems. Um, I think it's important at this time too, with so much going on and so much emotion, that we have a chance to express ourselves in written form and to be able to listen to things that mean something to you. It's very deep. And I thank everyone for joining us. Mai, would you like to say a few words? Yes, I would like to thank uh, the readers in my group today, Jenny, Adriana, Diane, and Pat. You guys uh, read some great stuff. I can't wait to go out and read them today, actually, you know, because they're just so inspiring, interesting um, stories and stuff. So I want to thank uh, all the presenter today. And I want to thank everyone who has joined us this afternoon. So I hope you are also inspired. And, you know, you heard some great stuff that makes you want to go out and, and check them out and read them. If you want a list of the, um, the books that we read this afternoon, please feel free to send me an email. I'll be more than happy to uh, send you the list that we read this afternoon. So thank you, everybody. Thank yeah, you thank for your you time. Thank you so much for coming. Thank, thank you, everybody. Bye. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Mm -hmm.